my friends, is Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Good afternoon. Latest figures show last month was the world's warmest September on record. With an average temperature of 16.38 Celsius, it was 0.5 degrees warmer than the previous warmest September in 2020. Well, the world is now on course for its hottest year ever. One climate scientist called the rise gobsmackingly bananas. Well, it comes as wildfires have again forced thousands of people out of their homes in Tenerife. Evacuations happened overnight after the fire in August, which had been under control, reignited in a forest. Popular tourist areas on Tenerife have so far been unaffected and its two airports have been operating normally. Meanwhile, Rishi Sunak's in Spain, where he's expected to urge European leaders to agree to better protection against criminal smuggling gangs. The Prime Minister's meeting with the European Political Community Summit to tackle crime linked to illegal migration. A Blade Runner vigilante who claims to have destroyed more than 150 ULES cameras says he has no plans to stop. It comes as the first fines imposed on motorists who have failed to pay the ULES since it expanded across Greater London were due to land on doormats. Well, well there have been three arrests and one person charged the vigilante say that support is growing for the campaign and it comes as five Just Stop Oil activists were arrested last night after interrupting a performance of Les Miserables in London's West End. Speaking to Talk TV anonymously, the campaign director of the Blade Runners, Captain Gasto, says it's unfair how differently the two campaign groups are treated. Every time I go on the radio and the media, People are very firm to say that what we're doing is against the law, illegal, etc., etc., and stop it. But yet, when the Just Up Oil lot or who and who uh, insulate Britain, all that lot, no one's ever held to account or brought to book like that. Yeah. Calvin Robinson has accused GB News of engaging in cancel culture a day after he was sacked from the channel. The former presenter was dismissed after he publicly supported Lawrence Fox, who also got sacked for his comments denigrating journalist Ava Santina. Speaking to Talk TV, the former presenter expe expressed the need to facilitate free speech, but also call out wrong behaviour. When we've got other broadcasters saying, close the whole thing down, GB News should not exist in the first place. Broadcasters and journalists should be saying, we need a difference of opinion, we need a broad spectrum of views, this is a good thing. What, and we can say that whilst also saying that what Lawrence said was wrong. I told him to his face as well, what you said was wrong, you didn't need to say that. A court has heard a row at the Glastonbury Festival led to a woman being shot dead in her own garden in Liverpool. 28-year-old council worker Ashley Dale was hit by a bullet fired from a machine gun in Old Swan last August. The trial of five men has been told that she was shot deliberately by gunmen looking for her boyfriend. All five deny murder. It's emerged Britain's historic Hadrian's Wall was damaged during the felling of the nearby Sycamore Gap tree. The iconic tree was cut down overnight last week in what detectives have called a deliberate act of vandalism. Historic England says the wall, which is nearly 2,000 years old, sustained some damage. Well, that's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. A rather rainy afternoon for many northern parts of Britain. Northern Ireland started off with the rain this morning and the Republic as well, but that has now moved along. So for this afternoon, Northern Ireland is looking a lot drier and brighter, but rain will continue moving its way north and eastwards over much of Scotland, as well as for parts of northern England and the north and west of Wales. Some patchy rain likely for the Midlands, perhaps the northeast of England later, but for many central and southern parts of England and Wales, I think it will be a mainly dry and bright afternoon. But it's a windy day once 
once again, so it won't feel that mild despite the sunshine. Overnight, we'll continue to see rain move its way eastwards. More rain coming in from the west across Ireland, Wales, and some patchy rain over parts of central England as well as northern England. Northwest Scotland also seeing spells of rain, but the rest of Scotland and southern parts of the UK will be mostly dry with clear spells. It will be a mild night across all areas. Then tomorrow, it will start to get become a bit warmer, but still some rain about. This time across parts of uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland at first, Northern England and Southern Scotland. And later on in the day, some uh, more widespread rain for Scotland, but central and southern areas mostly fine and bright. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Will I get a better interview roughing you up a bit? I'm Zlatan, uncensored. A very good day to you and welcome one and all to my afternoon blockbuster right here on Talk TV. Another busy news day, fasten your seatbelts. Here's what's coming up after Rishi Sunak ended the Tory conference with a rousing rallying cry that the Conservatives can still win the next election. He headed straight to Spain to confront an issue that is on course to lose it for him, the migrant crisis. The Prime Minister promised to stop the boats, has he? Uh, has he hell? Now he's in Granada for a summit at which he will try to persuade other European leaders to mount a coordinated effort to stop rocketing levels of illegal migration. But is cooperation with Britain's so-called partners the way forward? Or should we make our own decisions? 0344 499 1000. In other news, former England manager Kevin Keegan says he has a problem with women pub pundits talking about men's football. Do you? 0344 499 1000. Still with TV, the BBC is facing a furious backlash after pitting its controversial Jimmy Savile drama, The Reckoning, against ITV's Yorkshire Ripper series, The Long Shadow, in a head-to-head -head horror battle. <clears throat> the primetime face-off unfolds on Monday. Which one will you be watching? 0344 499 1000. In other news, stand by for extraordinary footage of a seething citizen furious with a litter bug copper who chucked his half-eaten sandwich out of a police car. Uh, just stop oil's dorks are at it again, causing misery at Les Miserables. And the Pope gets in on the Climate Change Emergency Act, blaming the West and America while praising China. Holy save the planet, what on earth is he on about? 0344 499 1000. Meanwhile, after police announced a corporate manslaughter probe into the hospital where nurse Lucy Letby murdered seven babies, why aren't the cops investigating the various executives accused of negligently allowing the angel of death to continue her killing spree? And finally, why are the woke warriors trying to cancel great artists? Picasso is the latest genius in the firing line. He wasn't nice to women. Therefore, his paintings must be erased from history. Does that work for you? 0344 499 1000. All that and so much more. So don't go anywhere. Stick with me right here, right now, at the home of free speech and common sense talk TV. Let's spend Thursday afternoon together. Now, uh, we have a packed show for you uh, today in the slipstream of the Tory conference. Uh, later on this hour, uh, we'll be uh, talking about uh, the Stop the Boats conference. Uh, that's what I'm calling it. It's not really. Uh, it's over in Spain. Rishi Sunak uh, is there talking to other European leaders, uh, trying to get some sort of consensus on what to do about mass migration, mass illegal migration. Uh, you know, they're talking about 750,000 migrants arriving in Italy this year alone, and we know where they're heading. It's not Rome, it's London. That's where they want to get to. Uh, so uh, that later, and also extraordinary, we'll show you an extraordinary 
video of a furious citizen, a furious guy attacking a copper who uh, apparently uh, just uh, was driving past his house, just chucked his sandwich out onto a grass verge by this guy's garden. Uh, the guy took a great exception to this uh, and we will show you that video later. Uh, he used some rather choice language. We'll bleep that out. Uh, but uh, the copper in question uh, is... Uh, under investigation. Uh, we'll uh, be reporting on that story later on in the hour, but you won't want to miss that video. I'm serious. Uh, now, first of all, though, uh, let's go to my first guest, political campaigns consultant, Rebecca Ryan. Uh, welcome, Rebecca. There you are. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Ah, can yeah, you yeah, yeah. I said, yeah, welcome, Rebecca. You're supposed yeah. to reply. Don't just sit there. <laughs> I'll, I'll, get, I'll get confused. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, welcome. <laughs> uh, let's talk about, uh, you know, R Rishi Sunak. Uh, before we talk about this conference he's gone to in Spain, uh, yeah. to talk to, uh, why do we keep calling them our partners? To talk to foreign countries, basically about our migrant crisis, uh, our partners. Uh, let's remind ourselves of uh, his words on the migrant crisis in his uh, keynote speech yesterday at the Tory conference. Take it away, Rishi. It is non-negotiable that you, the British people, decide who comes here and not criminal gangs. Our new law, will ensure that if you come here illegally, you will be detained and swiftly removed. Now, I am confident that once flights start going regularly to Rwanda, the boats will stop coming. I will do whatever is necessary to stop the boats. Well, uh, Rebecca, what he seems to think is necessary right now is talking to our partners, our other European leaders in Spain, uh, to try to get together a coordinated effort to stop the mass migration uh, from, of course, North Africa and the Middle East uh, to Italy and then on to France and then, of course, where they're, most of them are heading, the good old United Kingdom. Uh, now, you know, I'm not against George or, you know, leaders talking to each other, but historically, you know, when world leaders get together, uh, they achieve the square root of sod all. Uh, I, I just think that rather than talking to other our partners, uh, he should be concentrating on what Britain intends to do about its own problem. Uh, would you agree? Oh, absolutely. And as far as I understand, this conference in Spain isn't actually relating to the sort of the immigration crisis. It's relating to the war in Ukraine, and he's kind of trying to piggyback this issue on there. And we've seen over years how you know our so-called partners treat Britain when we go when we try to raise an issue that is not on the. Uh, the agenda of France and Germany in particular, but also places like Spain. So I can't imagine that he's going to have very much success there. It just seems to be, um, uh, you know, taking an opportunity to, to create a headline in the hope that voters will just read the headline and not read the detail and not follow up on what's been done. So um, I don't think it fills anyone with very much hope that anything's going to be achieved. Um, but, you know, he, he certainly should be trying in, in, in all areas. Uh, let's just see some results. I mean, this is the thing time is running out for him. You know, the clock is ticking, um, as you've said, as we've discussed numerous times, you know, <laughs> all of these things that he's trying and he says he's trying really, really hard. Um, he's not achieving anything. And it's uh, interesting to see that he's still going on about the Rwanda plan there. Um, he still holds out hope. Um, I don't think the rest of the country really <laughs> hold out much hope. But, you know, he's right, he's right. If they do if they are, do manage to, you know, put people on planes over to Rwanda, I'm sure the small boats will stop. Um, but let's see that actually start happening. Yeah, the, the corporate approach uh, to solving international uh, crises and problems doesn't tend to... Uh, bear much uh, fruit and uh, you know among the pe delegates at this conference in Spain will of course be France you mm -hmm. know and I keep hearing people from Labour we've got to get round the table with France you know really thrash out a situation where we can start to really stop these migrants coming from France France doesn't want to stop them it wants to get rid of them it wants to get them on the dinghies and over here so uh, you have to look at the motives of some of these countries uh, I don't think they're necessarily 
uh, genuine. I, the France is very disingenuous about mm. the migrant crisis. It just wants to kick them out and let them come to uh, yeah. Britain, and that's why uh, their crack coppers that we gave half a billion pounds to to uh, patrol their own beaches just sit around watching the dinghies leave, uh, m m applauding. I would imagine. Good luck in Britain. Good luck. Off you go. Uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to knock his attempts to talk to other world leaders on this, uh, but I'm not confident. Uh, uh, it will make any difference. It's time for Britain to take its own unilateral decisions about what it's going to do, and I would suggest top of that agenda should be leaving the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, let's uh, move on. I want to talk about uh, Rishi's nanny state smoking ban now. Uh, this is a system where he says essentially it's, a, it's borrowed from New Zealand, Jacinda mm. Ardern. Any policy you borrow from New Zealand <laughs> is bound to be disastrous. Uh, quite why he's looking up to Jacinda, I don't know at all. Uh, but what it is, it'll be a kind of age system. So if you're born before 2008, uh, you can carry on smoking. But if you're born after 2008, you're not allowed to smoke. Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, what can possibly go wrong? Nothing divisive about that at all. I mean, no prospect that people who are allowed to smoke might start selling cigarettes to kids who aren't allowed to smoke. Uh, and more to the point, what's it got to do with him or the government, whether or not you, me or any other adult in this country decides to indulge in the legal activity of smoking? And for that ma matter, uh, what's it got to do with him what I eat? If I want to eat uh, sugary food, drink sugary drinks and eat fatty food and drink a load of alcohol, none of these activities are illegal. Why does Sunak think he has the right to butt his nose into our lives when the Tories are supposed to stand for small government? You know, the power of the individual over the power of the state. This is socialism. This is nanny state socialism. Absolutely. It's managerialism, isn't it? And that's what the, the Conservative Party is sort of torn down the middle on. You've got these sort of the wet MPs who are really pro these managerial approaches where they sort of, you know, the, the sugar taxes and all of these things that sort of we know better how to look after this sort of working class folk. We'll teach them, you know, how to live a, a, a good life. And then you've got the other side of the of the Conservative Party who are fighting desperately for any kind of uh, policies that actually reflect conservatism. I mean, this is an absolute lunacy, isn't this? This this policy. You're going to have people who are who have been in the same year at school who then grow up to be adults and, and, and half of them will be able to smoke and the other half won't. <laughs> I mean, how are they going to check this? Are they, you know, is this about, you know, bringing ID cards to check your date of birth when you buy a cigarette? It, it's just an absolute nonsense. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be something that a Conservative government is getting itself involved in. You know, there's, smoking is, is, has vastly reduced anyway. People are, you know, uh, vaping or using uh, non-heat um, products. Um, and they, you know, it, it, it's taking its own course. Now, why is Rishi um, deciding to step in at this point, as you say, with a policy that's come from the Socialist Republic of New Zealand? Yeah. Um, and in, in order to try and... <laughs> you're going to have a, 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 a system at one point where you're going to, you know, people who are half of the country can smoke and half of them it's can't. It's ridiculous. And, you know, it, it's going to be... Yeah, it it's makes no sense whatsoever. It's, it's ridiculous. And of course... You know, I would encourage everyone not to smoke. If you smoke, try to give up. I used to smoke, yeah. I gave up. Uh, you know, it's not a great activity. It's not very healthy, but it's not illegal. Mm. Uh, so it's a question of personal choice. The Tories should not be standing in the way of people, adults, grown adults, making personal choice, choices about their lifestyle. It's just not conservative. Uh, Rishi Sunak doesn't seem to have a clue about that side of conservatism. Uh, let me ask you a quick question before we go to break, uh, Rebecca. Kevin Keegan and the former England manager, Liverpool legend and all that, uh, he has said, he has declared that uh, he watches football coverage on the telly and he has a problem with female pundits talking mm. about male football. Yeah. Uh, he doesn't uh, denigrate women's football at all. He says it's a great sport and everything. He said, but it's different. And he mm. thinks that uh, women pun pundits, they might understand the female game, but they can't understand the male game, and therefore he finds it, jar it jars with him. Now, mm. I I I'm not... What I feel about this is, is 
you know, when they when the BBC especially started saying, oh, you know, we don't want men anymore talking about football, so you get thousands of women uh, delivering their opinions. And at first, I found that a bit sort of unusual. I wasn't used to mm. it. Uh, but now, they've been around for years now, and I judge them by the same standard that I judge male pundits. Mm. You know, I like some of them, others I think are useless, which is exactly what I think about the men. But what do you think about uh, Kevin's uh, controversial comments there? I mean, I think he's entitled to his, to his opinion. I'm not offended on behalf of all women for the fact that he's, <laughs> he doesn't enjoy listening to them. You know, as you say, it's a, it's a case of, you know, case by case basis, isn't it? I was watching some women's football over the summer and, and the, the female pundits on there were really defeatist. You know, they were talking about, you know, it's all over and there was still half an hour left of the match, you know. So that that grated with me. I didn't enjoy that. Um, and but as you said, it, it's a case by case basis, but he's perfectly entitled to his opinion. And when you've got the principle that we say that, you know, absolutely, we have to defend the right for women to have separate sport because we are physically different, you know, we have a different physiology this is a separate sport then he's right in some ways that a woman wouldn't fully understand the experience of playing men's football because there is a difference so i think you, i don't think we can say he's wrong in that but at the same time there may be some female pundits who, who do a really good job um you know yeah. i think what he's grating against is that as you say in the beginning when it was kind of foisted on yeah. people wasn't it? it's like oh we, we're going to have some diversity now so let's get some women pundits on and that's grating because people think you know, you're, you're not here because you're good at your job. You're yeah. here because, you know, we're, we're, we're ticking some boxes. And then that just, you know, people it ruins it for people. Yeah, uh, indeed. Uh, I suspect a lot of guys in pubs around the country will be sympathising with Kevin. But let me ask the audience, what do you think? Is Kevin Keegan right uh, that uh, women uh, commenting on male football don't really know what they're talking about and maybe shouldn't be there? Is he right or is he wrong? Oh three four 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 nine nine one thousand. You are also the director of Defund the BBC, uh, Rebecca, and we need to talk about the BBC after the break. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. I'm talking to Rebecca Butt Ryan, political campaigns consultant, and this is Talk TV.
Uh, welcome back. I'm still talking to political campaigns consultant Rebecca Ryan, and in this respect, I'm talking to her as the director of Defund the BBC. Uh, Rebecca, uh, on Monday there will be a clash of the horrible titans as uh, two TV dramas uh, go out at the same time. Uh, one, uh, both controversial. One is called The Long Shadow. Uh, it's about uh, Yorkshire Ripper Peter Sutcliffe, whether or not we should be revisiting his horrific crimes, serial killer, of course, uh, is open to debate. Uh, and I think you and I have already uh, discussed whether or not the BBC ever should have uh, made the uh, Jimmy Savile drama. Uh, it's called The Reckoning. It stars Steve Coogan. Now, the thing is, uh, The Long Shadow, uh, the uh, story of Peter Sutcliffe, Yorkshire River, that's been running for two weeks on ITV, 9 o'clock. The BBC's The Reckoning starts on Monday and they've pitched it directly against The Long Shadow. Yeah. So you'll have a choice of which monster, which fiend mm. you want to watch the drama of. Mm. Uh, now, the BBC's been accused of very insensitive scheduling here, that if they must make this questionable drama about Jimmy Savile, I don't think they should have done, frankly, but if they must make it, uh, surely uh, out of respect to the victims, they, they don't want to know that it's being pitched in a kind of you know, TV ratings battle against the ITV horror drama. It's, it's a bit distasteful, isn't it? We're, lo we're just looking at um, uh, the trailers for both dramas uh, on Underlay, but uh, your thoughts, uh, Rebecca? Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, and as we talked about before, you know, the fact that the the BBC has made this uh, documentary where it's um, well, not documentary uh, drama, docu drama, docu drama, sorry, oh, yeah. um, using licence fee payers' money to create this uh, docu drama about a horrific. Uh, significant chunk of their their own history um essentially marking their own homework you know as we said this this should not have been made by the bbc and we suspected at the time that this was going to you know be used to get you know to trumpet some uh, huge viewing figures and the way they have positioned this is it, it shows that that's exactly what they are hoping to do there is no way that they should have been making this in the first place but they certainly shouldn't have put it out in this way yeah. um and yeah it's really distasteful and it's just horrendous for the victims uh, and of course uh, the reckoning the jimmy savile drama stars steve coogan who will no doubt deliver uh, a brilliant performance he's a great actor and of course a mimic as well so uh, he will be uh, perfect in the role. It'll be excellent. There's no doubt about that. It's just the drama itself. Should they yeah. have made it? And lest we make the mistake of feeling that the BBC is massively confident about this production, it's been re-editing it and re-editing it and re-editing it uh, for a year now. It's already uh, was scheduled to appear and they yanked it from the schedules because they thought it was too much of a hagiography of Jimmy <laughs> Savile and not sensitive enough to the victims they're terribly sensitive about whether or not they'll be telling the story of the victims rather than uh glamorizing jimmy savile uh but as you say also uh they're trying to sort of pull the plank out of their own eye because of course uh they basically uh, many uh, executives at the bbc turned a blind eye to jimmy savile and his rent not that they knew of all of his crimes but they knew he was a wrong one, and yet uh, they celebrated him as one of their major stars. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it goes out on uh, Monday. Uh, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I'm intrigued to have a look at it, and I'm sure a lot of other people will feel the same. But I, I, it's very distasteful, I think, that they've made it the subject of a kind of TV scheduling battle. Which fiend will you watch? Now, you've been watching um, the Yorkshire Ripper, but we got a better one for you, Jimmy Savile. I mean, it's it's really uh, un uncomfortable, all of this, isn't it? It's, it is deeply uncomfortable, and it is, it's so wrong. As you say there, they've taken so much time over this editing and re-editing, all of the, you know, hand-wringing about it, but actually what they should have done is not touch it at all. They should not have been involved in the making of this story because this is a story that they're up to the necks in it with. So it should have been for a different broadcaster to a production to make 
this and to tell this story and then they would have saved license fee pay a load of money on 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 what this debate is about how they tell the story right well it's not your story to tell it's you know for someone else to tell that story because you are implicated um but yeah it's it's really wrong that you know they've set this up as some kind of grim competition between jimmy savile and uh the Yorkshire Ripper. Um, you know, obviously they're very aware that you know true crime is, has a huge fan base. You know, there are a lot of people yeah. who are interested in watching these kind of programs. So it's just really distasteful to see the BBC uh, involving in this kind of way when this should have been done by somebody else. But if the BBC was going to do it, they should definitely have put it out in a far more respectful way. Uh, indeed. And uh, I, the other reason uh, I uh, will guiltily watch uh, this four-part. Jimmy Savile drama, The Reckoning, is to find out just how much time the BBC devotes in this drama to its own disgraceful failings over Savile, uh, basically yeah. turning a blind eye uh, to his activities. And when they found out j just what a monster he was, uh, they quashed a, net, mm. uh, a news night investigation into Jimmy Savile because said, oh, uh, the then Director General said, well, we can't put that out because we've got a Christmas special, Shane Ritchie recreating Jimmy's beloved show, Jim Will Fix It, uh, which resulted in the uh, Director General losing his job. I wonder how much The Reckoning will focus on that. My bet, not much. Uh, Rebecca, great to talk to you as always. That's Rebecca Ryan, political campaigns consultant. She'll be back next week uh, with her regular shot. Now, next up, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the migrant crisis, the conference going on right now in Spain with Rishi Sunak, uh, with former MEP Ben Habib. See what he has to say about it and what solutions he thinks uh, the Prime Minister should be thinking about. As I keep saying, I'm not against him talking to other leaders, our partners and all that, but it won't bear any fruit. It won't produce anything. They never achieve anything, these international gatherings. I'd rather he was back here coming up with practical solutions to a crisis that if he doesn't solve, he will lose the next election on the back of. Uh, your thoughts? 0344 1,000. That next, I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. This is Talk TV. Will I get a better interview roughing you up a bit? Will I get the real Zlatan then? You want to play with fire, I will bring you fire, but I will burn you. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. When you score a goal, is it better than sex? Sex is better. Whoever thinks different, he has a problem with his sex. <laughs> I'm the best. I'm Zlatan. I'm censored. Welcome back. Now, earlier in the show, uh, we were talking about this conference, uh, this summit uh, that uh, Rishi Sunak has flown out to in Spain, uh, where he's gathering uh, with our partners, in other words, other leaders of Europe uh, all around uh, the EU and everything, Italy, etc., France. Uh, and uh, he wants them uh, to come up with some sort of coordinated effort to stop the boats. And by that, I don't mean the boats that come across the Channel, but the boats that come across from North Africa to Italy, uh, from the Middle East to Italy. Uh, Italy uh, expecting or, or fearing that as many as 750,000 migrants might invade their shores this year. And we know where they're all heading. They're not looking for a new life in Rome. They're coming our way. Uh, let's uh, talk to Ben Habib, former Brexit Party MEP. Uh, hello, Ben. Good afternoon, Kevin. Uh, what is your feeling about this? You know, as I say, I'm not against uh, world leaders or European leaders talking about this crisis, but I... I I'm at the point now where I think the more you lot talk about it, the less that seems to get done. Uh, it is time, uh, by all means, talk to the French and the Italians and the Spanish. Uh, but isn't it time that Rishi Sunak and this country just decided to make its own decisions, that he decided to make the decisions for Britain that will solve our own migrant crisis? Well, I'm so glad you said that, because the European Union is not any conduit for a solution to this problem. It, the European Union is part of the problem. And the reason I say that is because the EU fundamentally believes 
in nation states being abolished. That's why they've got the Schengen zone. That's why they want to have a borderless Europe. They want to have what they call a United States of Europe. But actually what they're seeking is a complete uh, coalescing of Europe into one entity. So migration across Europe for them is not an issue. Um, and if you, if you want to undermine a nation state, what better way to do it? What better way to get rid of national culture, history, heritage, and all of that than to have immigration? It helps the EU for nation state cultures and their people to be devalued, if you like, by unbridled migration. The EU can never be a solution to this problem. The EU is part of the problem. And the only solution to this problem is nation states taking it upon themselves to enforce their borders. That's why we call it border control. It's about controlling your borders. It's not about deporting people who enter your country illegally. That may be what you need to do if border control is not working. But you have to exercise unilateral border control. Italy needs to take a leaf out of the Australian playbook. It needs to send out its navy, its coast guard. It needs to stop these boats in the Mediterranean, board them if necessary, take control of those boats, and sail them straight back to where they came from. And we similarly, as an independent sovereign nation, need to stop the dinghies in the channel and turn them back to France. And if we all did this as independent nation states, you wouldn't need cooperation because you'd stop the flow of people overnight. And the idea, just before viewers watching me saying what I'm saying, you know, uh, roll their eyes in, in in disbelief because people in dinghies may suddenly jump out and drown in the channel. Belgium, which which is a country that also has boats leaving its shores, intercepts them in the sea, and it turns back successfully 90% of all launching. The French, by their own reckoning, and, you know, I'm doubtful about their numbers, turn back 45% and we're giving them half a billion. There's no solution to this problem through multilateral or bilateral agreement. Nation states evolved over thousands of years with borders for a reason, and we need to protect those borders. We need border control. That is a physical process. It's not a legislative one. It's a physical protection of our borders that is needed right across Europe. Uh, and, uh, you know, they always uh, are very keen to stress the uh, European Convention on Human Rights uh, is not the EU. It's nothing to do with the EU. I say there's a kind of an umbilical attachment there. Uh, they are sort of part and parcel of the European project. Now, we're in the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, Rishi's Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, uh, has made it quite clear that it's time that we left the ECHR so that we can make our own decisions and not be thwarted uh, by the European Court on Human Rights, just as we were uh, a couple of years back now when we tried to fly uh, migrants to Rwanda and they ordered us to keep the plane on the ground and they still haven't managed to get anyone to Rwanda. Uh, also, his business secretary, Kemi Badenoch, says we've got to leave the ECHR. Why do you think uh, the Prime Minister himself doesn't want to leave the ECHR? Well, I don't think they've got the political courage to do it. If they had the, politi if they had the requisite political courage to actually govern the country as an independent sovereign state, they would have stopped the boats using the British Navy years ago. You know, this wouldn't be a problem. Um, the, the ECHR, just before we get on to the ECHR in detail, just to make the point that the European Union is not a member of the European Convention of Human Rights. Yeah, that's, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. <laughs> okay, which is really interesting. And they, they're not a member because they refuse to have the European Court of Justice, uh, which is their own court in, 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 uh, in the European Union, their own court to be subjugated to the ECHR. But here we are, the United Kingdom, a country that actually established international human rights, way before other countries have even conceived of the notion. Here we are subjugating our Supreme Court to an unelected bunch of people who make up the law on the hoof, often against British national interest, against parliamentary will, and we don't have a government that's courageous enough either to ignore their rulings or to leave the convention. 
And actually, we should leave the convention. Suella's absolutely right to say we should leave it. It's gone way beyond what it was when it was set up, I think, in 1946, um, uh, you know, as a, as a mechanism effectively to bring peace to Europe. It wasn't the UK that needed policing. It was the French and the Germans who kept going at each other every five seconds that required us, first of all, to intervene militarily in Europe and then to settle the European Convention so the Europeans could be safe. The UK can very easily leave this convention. Human rights will be upheld in this country. We establish international human rights in this country. We lead the field in them. And I noticed just online before I came to talk to you, Kevin, that Leo Varadkar uh, also is this this summit, the European political community Mm. in Spain. And he's talking about how worried he is about the United Kingdom, talking about the dilution of human rights. Well, he's the prime minister of a country that actively aided and abetted a terrorist organization over 40 years to come across into the United Kingdom, across their borders, uh, uh, shoot and blow up British citizens, escape back across the border, and then look after and protect them. This man is part of the problem as well. What we need, without wishing to repeat myself too much, but I think I've got to do it, is a government that believes in the nation state, that takes control of its its borders, enforces its borders, and repels people who are trying to enter the country illegally. That's fundamental. It's so simple. It's what we would have done at any time in history, other than now we've become so politically weak. We haven't got the courage to protect our own borders. And that is the end of the nation state. And that's why Suella is right to say we are facing an existential threat to Western liberal democracy by this unbridled immigration, yeah. of which, just to repeat myself again, the EU is part of the problem. Absolutely. Uh, as uh, Suella Brown uh, said, uh, there's a hurricane of migrants coming our way. Uh, and the wind of change is going to turn into uh, something uh, disastrous unless we get a grip on this. And uh, we need to make our own decisions. Uh, you shouldn't be turning to Europe. You're exactly right, Ben. Uh, always a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, apologies for the connection there with Ben. There was some sort of problem, but I think you could hear what he was saying. Uh, so we stuck with him. Uh, what do you think of what he was saying? What do you think of what I'm saying? Which is, you know, fine, go and talk to the French and the Italian but never mind them, make our own decisions. That's why we voted to leave the EU. He's talking to the EU about what we should do about the migrant crisis. Uh, As Ben says, they're part and parcel of the problem and uh, they're very happy for us to receive a load of migrants as long as they get out of France. Uh, What do you think? 0344 499 1000. When we come back, I'll be showing you that amazing video of a seething citizen who confronted a copper uh, who... Uh, stood accused of hurling a, his half-eaten sandwich out of a police car onto a grass verge near to this guy's garden. He's very, very angry, and you can see the copper uh, kind of realises the error of his ways. So uh, stand by for that. You won't want to miss it. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. This is Talk TV. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. Stop working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Are you making me cry again? They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. He was clearly something of the face of the ward, so even more mm. unthinkable. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a ward, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales, because you're not just marrying the man, you're marrying the job. That resonates with people. Elaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Yes. Labour has 29 points ahead in the polls. Can we? Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs and they bent the rules or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? 
There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unraveled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll! If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this now. Don't get around! Markle, about get around. Mark. Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much! <laughs> very nice of you! Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. We're now in Barbie world! You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should you be concerned? By <laughs> if it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke. Welcome back. Uh, breaking news. Uh, Jaswant Singh Chail, uh, who threatened to kill the Queen after breaking into the grounds of Windsor Castle with a loaded crossbow, has been sentenced to nine years in prison with a further five years on licence. He's been sentenced to a hybrid order, which means he will remain at Broadmoor High Security Psychiatric Hospital until he is capable of being transferred to prison. Uh, time spent in detention at the hospital will be taken off his prison sentence the judge said earlier. I do believe he was charged uh, with a treason. Uh, so uh, that is his sentence. Nine years. Pretty hefty. Uh, now, uh, I promised you uh, this extraordinary video of a, a policeman uh, who a uh, seething citizen saw hurl a half-eaten sandwich out of a police car onto this nice grass verge by his garden. Um, and the, the citizen... Uh, we're not sure who he is. We tried to find him. Uh, if, you, if you're out there, give us a call. Um, uh, he made his feelings very, very clear. Have a look at this. Have you got an excuse why you pull up outside, outside my house and throw rubbish out your car? Is there a reason for that? I will definitely... Take pick the, the, pick the crust up and take it with you. I will do. I go on, off you go. I'm not going to do it while you're telling me to do it. Oh, you will? Because I ain't moving until you do it. This is my house and you just discard your food on the side of the road. Do whatever you need to do. Well, I'll pick it up. I will take it with me. If pick you, it up. If you let me go. Pick it up. I will do. Once pick it up then. Oh, I'll shout at what I want. It's no law against it, is there? How dare you come to somebody's house and discard your food in front of their house, even whether it's a public property or not? Who the hell do you think you are? Well, uh, that was a uh, Thames Valley officer. Uh, you could see uh, what happened there. Uh, he kind of, the copper at first tried to sort of act like he didn't do this, but he clearly did, and then he kind of climbed down a bit. Uh, I should read uh, the statement uh, from uh, Thames Valley Police. Uh, we are aware of a video being widely shared on social media involving one of our officers. The video has been reviewed internally and we have spoken to the officer involved. We have also been uh, to discuss the encounter and the officer's actions with the individual. Uh, we... Uh, strive to learn from our encounters with the public so the officer involved has been given a chance to reflect on their actions his actions uh, and learn from them uh, our independent scrutiny group uh, is made up of members of the public uh, if they have any further recommendations for us uh, we will be uh, seeking to get them uh, with me now is a uh, former Met Police Detective Chief Inspector Mike Neville who 
I would hazard a guess would never, during his time as a police officer, done such a thing. I mean, you know, really, Mike, he's a copper. You know, it's, it's littering. It's not the worst of offences, but it's not a good look for a cop, is it? It isn't, no. And I, I was in the uh, Royal Military Police and the, the motto was Exemplo Ducimus, we lead by example. And if the police don't set the example, what, what can the public expect? expect? And I'm disappointed here because I've worked with Thames Valley Police and they are really, really good police force, one of the best in the country. Mm. So it's, it's a shame that this has happened and it's just, it's simply not good enough. And I don't know about reflecting, when, when I was a young PC, I think the sergeant might have been a bit more uh, heavy-handed and, and perhaps a bit more disciplined in police forces mm. might, uh, might assist and grip this sort of behaviour. Actually, the copper, we shouldn't make personal aspersions, I suppose, but he looks like a, a kind of actor playing a copper, sort of good-looking guy from a TV drama, but he's a real copper, uh, and uh, at first he tried to deny he did it, well, the bloke saw it, and then they say, I'm not going to do it while you're shouting at me, and that citizen uh, quite rightly says, there's no law against shouting, and then he goes on to say, quite interestingly, he said, that's, what, that's the trouble with you coppers, you think little people like us are beneath you, and you can behave like this, uh, and there is that sort of suspicion here, isn't there? Yeah, it's dreadful. I mean, the, the confidence... It's at a time when confidence at police is even lower than it is. It's so low, it's bad. It, it just sums it up. And when you join the police, it's like joining the army, in my view, or becoming a nurse. It's about service before self. You're supposed to set a top example and be there to help the little people, not be upsetting them. That guy's got CCTV on his house. That should be used for catching thieves, burglars and whatever else, not catching police officers flinging half the lunch out of the, uh, the window. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I consider myself to be, you know, a reasonably law-abiding citizen, and, and just on a, co you know, on a common decency level, I would never do anything like that. I wouldn't just chuck a sandwich out of somebody's garden. I mean, where does this copper get off? Uh, it, it is appalling, it is. And, and the, the, uh, the initial bit, they're trying to bluff out of it, trying to deny that he yeah. done it. I mean, there really is an issue. That is an issue of honesty. That is, you know, it's just, that is just not good enough. And, and just... And sometimes, somebody sent me a message saying, look, why don't this guy just... When you're in a hole, stop digging. Why not just say, <laughs> yeah. I'm really, really sorry. That just diffuses it. I'm really sorry. I've had a bad day. I've done something stupid. Please, I, I, I apologise for what I've done. I'm going to pick up this sandwich. Really. And, and I think if he'd done that, this would have all stopped. You know, because the, the video wouldn't be as exciting, would it, if he'd done that? But it's the way he, he tries to bluff and then he tries to resist and all this, I'm not doing it because you're telling me to do it. It's like some truculent child. In a, in a school, in a classroom. Uh, it, it really is. And uh, I mean, also, coppers, as I say, I don't consider myself to be a sort of paragon of virtue and human decency, uh, but I would never think about doing that, chucking a sandwich into somebody's garden. Uh, what this copper uh, stands accused of, in my view, is just not knowing right from wrong. Yeah, and you and not you, a good look for and, a and not a good look because that's the police should be there, as I say, to help and defend. I always saw my job as helping the little people, the people who live on an estate where it's rough and it, it it's, litter sends a bad message to everybody. Litter, graffiti, it yeah. says this area is run down, and the police should be solving this problem, not contributing to it. Uh, absolutely. Um, so, in fairness to uh, Thames Valley Police, they've made it clear that this officer will be spoken to. I mean, he needs a, some sort of official reprimand for this, doesn't? Yeah, I think. And, but it's like everything this well. Sometimes it's all about paper. He needs a good rifting off the sergeant. The sergeant needs to grip him and say, this is not good enough. I'm going to be watching what you're doing. In times past, he would have been given some awful duty, lots of night duties. But, of course, they can't punish people like that anymore. But I, I can only reiterate, I've had really good experience with Thames Valley Police. So this is a really this is a disappointment. Uh, one off. Well, 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 OK, let's hope it is. Uh, while you're here, Mike, uh, talking about uh, police and the way they behave, uh, I don't know if you saw the video yesterday of Lawrence Fox, uh, you know, the actor turned activist, uh, who uh, he did a video uh, a while back uh, basically supporting these uh, vandals who vandalise ULES cameras, the Blade Runners and all that. And basically he said, good for you, I support you, I do it more, do it more, do it more. Uh, the, he's now being investigated uh, for conspiracy to vandalise public property. Uh, you know, I suppose there's a case for that. I, I wouldn't have thought it was really worth going. He's just an actor who made a bloody video. What's the big deal? Anyway, uh, he, he uh, put himself live on video as they raided his uh, house in London yesterday. And about eight officers going through every, you know, searching every... 
uh, every corner of his house. Eight officers. Now, if this doesn't result in a conviction, or frankly, even if it does, but let's just say, uh, so he was then hauled to the police station, spent hours in there being interrogated and all that, uh, released on bail eventually, no charges yet as far as I'm aware. Uh, but if this doesn't turn into a conviction, I think we need to ask Sir Mark Rowley, the uh, Met Chief Police, the Met uh, Police Chief, whether or not he thinks this is a good use of eight coppers' time. What do you think? Well, I'm with you, because those eight coppers could have been spent catching burglars, robbers, things like that. And the other thing you see is, is people will see this, is this really impartial policing? Because we get so many celebrities who will come up with things for supporting Just Stop Oil, all Extinction Rebellion, all these things that do vandalism, but they target the people who support something that's not so fashionable so if you do if you support fashionable things that's acceptable and i just that's the worrying thing for me that they seem to target people who have unfashionable views that's exactly what i said to uh, my wife last night i said these coppers these policemen they cannot stop themselves uh, sort of persecuting people who are right wing as you say when just stop oil ruined the lives of thousands of motorists by uh, you know gluing themselves to the street and blocking roads or even last night ruining the fun we're going to be covering this story in a little while of uh, the enjoyment of a theatre audience in the West End by gluing themselves to the stage um, the police always seem to support Just Up Oil uh, during the Covid crisis you know uh, anti-vaxxers demonstrators they were down on them like a ton of brick they can't stop themselves going for right-wing people can I think they it's a cultural thing Kevin because I think the senior when I joined the police half of the senior officers were ex-army they're not anymore yeah. they're all of a certain ilk they're all university graduates and they want to bring in university graduates and they often empathize with these just up oil people but they don't empathize with people who support Millwall Football Club <laughs> or uh, you know so if the Millwall Football Club you know they smashed up things they'd be smashed up themselves at the Notting Hill Carnival people are allowed to get away with it and it, we see this time and time again and it's just not a good look the police should be utterly impartial absolutely uh, mike listen thanks very much for coming in always a pleasure to talk to you uh listen after the break we will be uh, covering uh, the raid on les miserables last night and uh, having a word with the pope uh, not personally but about his opinions on climate change he's all over the place holy save the planet i'm kevin o'sullivan this is talk tv
on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon. Two nurses have been found guilty of unlawfully drugging patients following allegations they carried out their crimes for their own amusement and an easy life. 54-year-old Catherine Hudson and 48-year-old Charlotte Wilmot ill-treated those in their care on a stroke unit at Blackpool Victoria Hospital between February 2017 and November 2018. They faced a total of nine counts concerning five patients with Hudson found not guilty of three counts. Wilmot was also found guilty of encouraging Hudson to sedate a patient. A man who wanted to kill Queen Elizabeth II and was found with a crossbow in the grounds of Windsor Castle has been sentenced to nine years in prison by a judge at the Old Bailey. Jaswant Singh Chael has been given what's called a hybrid order, which means he'll stay in Broadmoor High Security Psychiatric Hospital until he's well enough to go to jail. He's the first person in the UK to be convicted of treason since 1981. He pleaded guilty to the charge in February, along with making threats to kill and being in possession of an offensive weapon. The total sentences amount to nine years custody with a further license period of five years. The defendant may go down. The Prime Minister's in Spain, where he's expected to urge European leaders to agree to better protection against criminal smuggling gangs. Rishi Sunak is meeting with the European Political Community Summit to tackle crime linked to illegal migration. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is also at the meeting this afternoon. Officials from Ukraine said at least 49 people had been killed in Ukraine after a Russian missile strike. It hit a cafe and a food shop in the northeast of the country in Kharkiv. A six-year-old boy is also reportedly among the victims. Calvin Robinson has accused GB News of engaging in cancel culture a day after he was sacked from the channel. The former presenter was dismissed after he published publicly supported Lawrence Fox, who also got sacked for his comments denigrating journalist Ava Santina. While speaking to Talk TV, the former presenter expressed the need to facilitate free speech, but also call out wrong behaviour. Well, we've got other broadcasters saying, close the whole thing down, GB News should not exist in the first place. Broadcasters and journalists should be saying, we need difference of opinion, we need a broad spectrum of views, this is a good thing. What, and we can say that whilst also saying that what Lawrence said was wrong. I told him to his face as well, what you said was wrong, you didn't need to say that. And a pair of rare red panda cubs born in Whipsnade Zoo in June have been given their first checkups by a vet. Zookeepers are slowly letting twins Alex and Priya start to leave their nesting box and explore their surroundings. They weighed just 113 grams when they were born, about the same size as a banana, and are now growing well. Experts say the pair gave double hope for the endangered species. Well, that's the latest now time for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello. A rather rainy afternoon for many northern parts of Britain. Northern Ireland started off with the rain this morning and the Republic as well, but that has now moved along. So for this afternoon, Northern Ireland is looking a lot drier and brighter, but rain will continue moving its way north and eastwards over much of Scotland, as well as for parts of northern England and the north and west of Wales. Some patchy rain likely for the Midlands, perhaps the northeast of England later, but for many central and southern parts of England and Wales, I think it will be a mainly dry and bright afternoon. But it's a windy day once again again, so it won't feel that mild despite the sunshine. Overnight we'll continue to see rain move its way eastwards, more rain coming in from the west across Ireland, Wales and some patchy rain over parts of central England as well as northern England. Northwest Scotland also seeing spells of rain, but the rest of Scotland and southern parts of the UK will be mostly dry with clear spells. It will be a mild night across all areas. Then tomorrow it will start to get become a bit warmer, but still some rain about, this time across parts of uh, Ireland, northern Ireland at first, northern England and southern Scotland, and later on in the day some uh, more widespread rain for Scotland, but central and southern areas mostly fine and bright.
Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Will I get a better interview roughing you up a bit? I'm Zlatan, uncensored. This is hour two of my two-hour afternoon spectacular, and uh, news is breaking fast. Uh, we have lots of breaking news. Breaking like a blizzard, it is. Uh, here's the latest bulletin. Prosecutors have concluded there is no realistic prospect of conviction for 21 people arrested on the day of the King's coronation to prevent a breach of the peace, and they will face no further action. Uh, that is a statement from the Metropolitan Police. Uh, if you remember, uh, these were people, uh, some of them from the organisation Republic, uh, you know, those ones who go, uh, not my king, not our king, not in our name, all that stuff. Uh, my my view on it, I mean, it was a shame they tried to spoil that special day, but uh, you do have a right to demonstrate in public, and they were all arrested. They were shunted off very, very quickly, within about 90 seconds of arriving. Uh, well, so why did the police arrest them uh, if they've now concluded there's no uh, possible uh, chance of conviction? Uh, I wonder what you think about that. 03444991000. I suppose the question is... Should they have been arrested uh, now that uh, the conclusion is there's no realistic prospect of conviction? They should have realised that, shouldn't they? There you go, not my king, not my king. You know the score. Uh, let me know what you think. And further, but one other um, issue I'd like you to give us a call on. We showed you that video uh, just now of the copper uh, chucking a sandwich onto somebody's garden and the guy going, you know, pick it up, stop it, you know. Uh, you know, the, the, the Thames Valley Police say he uh, has been spoken to and given time to reflect on his actions and all that. Well, I'm getting texts and calls from people saying, well, isn't littering a criminal offence? Shouldn't he be fined uh, rather than just be told by the police you must reflect on your actions? You know, if I rob a bank, it's not likely that the police say, well, you should reflect on your actions. Uh, so should he be fined? You know, should he be convicted for that? It is breaking the law. 03444991000. Uh, talking of breaking the law, uh, let's talk about Just Stop Oil, uh, who uh, broke the law last night by breaking in to a West End theatre to completely uh, spoil a performance of the classic musical Les Miserables. Uh, misery at Les Miserables. Uh, and they, uh, you know, the Just Up Oil mob, they leapt onto the stage at the finale, you know, when they're singing, Can you hear the people sing? Uh, as the headline said, Can you hear the people... Can you hear the people groan? Uh, let's play it. Uh, you should be able to hear it. Uh <laughs> popular as ever. I mean, some of these people, they, it's not cheap to go to the West End. Some of these people in the audience have paid £200 to watch this performance. This is the fight finale, the conclusion, completely spoiled. Here comes the fire curtain. Uh, you know, there they go again. What do they ever achieve by this? Absolutely nothing. It is nothing to do with just stopping oil. It's nothing to do with saving the planet. It's due to these pathetic middle-class idiots and their ego. Look at us, we're so virtuous, we're trying to save the world. They're not doing it for any other reason than attention-seeking. It's as simple as that. Uh, let's talk uh, to uh, the head of policy at Net Zero Watch, Harry Wilkinson. Hello, Harry. 
Good afternoon. Uh, in a little while, I want to talk to you about the Pope, Pope Francis, who seems to have caught the climate change emergency disease uh, in a bizarre way, I might add. We'll talk about that in a second. But uh, these net, net, uh, these uh, Just Up Oil people, I mean, they've been doing this now, you know, stopping traffic, gluing themselves to motorways, and now they've chosen theatres, they've been destroyed or damaging artworks at galleries. You know, these very public demonstrations, it's very important we do this we understand that people are upset but you know we've got a planet to say well here they are two years into this pathetic campaign what's the result of it uh, rishi sunak announcing uh, uh two weeks ago he's going to do a complete u-turn on green policies and get rid of a load of them so why are they still doing this when it's clearly utterly utterly ineffective well my heart does go out to the people in the audience who as you say pay good money to be there it could have been a really important family occasion for them. I remember seeing it with my dad. It was a wonderful memory seeing that uh, play. And so for them to ruin it uh, for people in the audience is is a very despicable thing to do. I mean, one thing reflecting here is, you know, Les Miserables itself is about people who did break the law because they did think they have a, a, a had a reasonable cause. You know, so it is really important for us to actually attack and actually examine uh, just the Poyle's cause. You know, they are unfortunately inspiring uh, some people to behave in a similar way and do similarly destructive things. The point here is if we did just stop oil, that would cause immense suffering overnight. You know, <laughs> oil is and fossil fuels at the moment are essential to our modern way of life. And politicians have promised to transition us away from that. Uh, and as the Prime Minister has said, when he reversed uh, or slightly backpedaled on the speed of how fast we would go to achieve net zero, you know, he said we have to do this in a pragmatic way. And that's absolutely right. Um, what these people want is just for everything to s shut down. And that would be far more damaging uh, than anything that we would experience from climate change. And climate change is real, it's a significant problem. But at the same time, we can look at the numbers and see that fewer people are dying in extreme weather events than ever before. And actually, the United Nations says that there's low confidence in any trends uh, in flooding, in droughts, in tropical storms. So what they say about climate change is completely divorced from the reality of what the science actually tells us about climate change. Political leaders need to call out this misinformation for what it is. They spout misinformation all the time. You know, if, if the world really was going to end, this may be a rational cause of action. But actually, what they believe about climate change is completely wrong. Yeah, it's, inco it's, well, in isn't gonna it's incoherent. I mean, it, it's just... It's sort of uh, ecologically illiterate. Uh, doesn't seem to take into account that uh, even if we do reach this sort of bizarre carbon net zero thing in 2050, uh, carbon net zero does not involve the elimination of oil, uh, gas and fossil fuels. It does not involve that. Uh, they will still be there. So their whole kind of central... Uh, proposal is just nonsense and you have to ask and given that we've seen that the whole effect on government is uh, to stage a U-turn on their former greenery and say actually we're going to ditch quite a few of these green policies uh, you wonder what it is why they're doing this because they've just seen demonstrably two weeks ago that their campaign to persuade the government to uh, stop using oil a stupid proposal as I say just has not worked at all. So why are they still doing it? Uh, well, they're displaying what seems to be like cult-like behaviour. You know, you wouldn't invite members of all sorts of wacky religious cults on to, to these big public platforms all the time. But sometimes you, you look at what Just Up All do, you see how members of their organisation uh, are then appearing in the media and and you can see the justification you can see the fact that they're getting a bigger platform you now whenever they're getting a platform they're getting a platform to spread their deeply damaging views you know children are being misled by this children are thinking the world's going to end um, and they're having nightmares about climate change when they don't need to be having those uh, thoughts at all so 
the, the, these are irresponsible people spreading irresponsible views, but they're inspired by to do so, you know, by their cult-like devotion to this cause. You know, people in our modern secular society still need something to believe in. And for these people, uh, they want to believe in everyone's sins being expressed through their carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, and the only way to achieve salvation is to reduce our emissions. Otherwise, we're facing the apocalypse. This is a classic religious style narrative. Um, and, and and we're seeing where those views... Yeah, they're, they're a weird death cult. They're a doom cult. Uh, uh, but they seem to have persuaded the Pope uh, to come round to their way of thinking. Pope Francis, in an extraordinary speech, uh, said the world is collapsing due to climate change and near to breaking point. Uh, and he, he buys straight into the fact that, yes, climate change is being caused by humanity. There's no scientific proof of that. There's a... Uh, fair possibility we may be contributing, but there's no proof whatsoever that mankind is actually responsible for climate change. Climate change is happening as it always has uh, due to the cyclical nature of our planet. Uh, but whether or not it's our fault uh, is open to debate, but not with Pope Francis. He says uh, that uh, we have to do something about it right now. And uh, extraordinarily, bizarrely, he blames Western culture for this problem, uh, and pointing out and, and holds up China as a paragon of virtue, uh, saying uh, that America, Americans per person uh, produce two times more emissions than people living in China. Uh, so it's basically saying, if only the Americans were like China. What on earth is this guy talking about? That China is the worst offender when it comes to pollution. It produces 28% of the world's carbon emissions uh, and uh, is doing nothing about that. It's actually busy building 300 new coal fuel power stations. It's already got 1,100. Uh, it's extraordinary uh, that the Pope, the Holy Father, should somehow say China's great and America's awful. What's he talking about? Uh, well, as a Catholic myself, I'm loath to criticise uh, his <laughs> holiness. However, what I would say is I'd politely ask him uh, to look at the available evidence on this. You know, when it comes to climate change, the, the greenhouse effect is fairly well established. Carbon dioxide, more carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere um, caused by human emissions is likely to the, raise the temperature, other things being equal. The, the point is the climate is really complex. There are many no other natural factors and establishing you know, which proportion is caused by which um, cause is complicated. But I think what I would say to the Pope is when he's criticizing Western lifestyles, look at what's happened to Western country emissions over the past few decades. They've come down quite considerably. Now in the UK, we've reduced our emissions by 50%. Uh, while actually using a similar percentage of uh, fossil fuels as, as we did before. We still use fossil fuels for about 80% of our energy needs, and that's only come down slightly. Most of those uh, have uh, reductions have come from you know, efficiency savings. We've been improving the products we use, and, and we've been reducing our emissions as a result. But we can become so uh, narrow in our Western uh, mindset sometimes you know most of the people in the world live in developing countries uh, and and they're being lifted out of poverty at an extraordinary rate uh, thanks to the industrialization that's brought about by capitalism that's brought about uh, by fossil fuel powered economies uh, that are giving people all sorts of up new opportunities. That's not a doom and gloom story. That's a, a wonderfully positive story uh, in which people are coming out of poverty. And, and the Western lifestyles that he's criticizing uh, are actually just what people are aspiring to in other countries because they're in destitution uh, previously. They're quite right to aspire to have more than that. Um, so I think you know, he needs to look at more different viewpoints. I would criticise maybe his advisors first and foremost. For letting him make really, I'm not showing the broad range of views that are out there. They're not showing him, you know, the range of evidence that is there 
for him to have Absolutely. a bit of a bang perspective. My, 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 uh, far bit for me to correct the ho Holy Father, but the big problem here, it's not Western lifestyles, it's Eastern lifestyles. It's China, it's Russia, it's India. These are the big polluting countries. He's pointing the finger at the wrong people. Uh, and I would have expected better. Uh, from the pontiff. Uh, but uh, excellent to talk to you, Harry. Thank you very much for your time. Harry Wilkinson there, Head of Policy at Net Zero Watch. Uh, when we come back, uh, the latest on the Let B case, the Lucy Let B case, uh, there's been big developments there. Uh, we'll be talking to Peter Blexley about that. That next, I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. This is Talk TV. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Not working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Are you making me cry again? They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. He was clearly something of the face of the ward, so it's even more mm. unthinkable. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a ward, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales, because you're not just marrying the man, you're marrying the job. That resonates with people. Elaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Yes. Labour absolutely. 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, no, in the polls. No, no, can we? On. Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs and they bent the rules or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unravelled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll! If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the charts in this show. Oh, Get Meghan Markle, about Get Meghan Markle. Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. <laughs> We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should you be concerned? <laughs> <honestly>. <laughs> If it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke. Uh, welcome back. Uh, let's talk about Lucy Letby, the angel of death, the nurse who's uh, serving a whole life sentence uh, for the murder of uh, seven babies up at the Countess... Uh, um, at the uh, hospital in Chelsea, uh, Chester, uh, Countess of Chester, up, up there in the north. Uh, now, what happened yesterday was that uh, the police uh, revealed there they've launched a corporate manslaughter probe into the hospital. So that's in effect uh, possibly to uh, convict the hospital and the manager, the way that hospital was run. Uh, it's like a sort of a, a accusing a business of doing something wrong and convicting that business. So the Countess of Chester Hospital could uh, face charges of corporate manslaughter. Very, very difficult to prove. Uh, the point is, the reason for that alleged corporate manslaughter is allegedly the uh, stewardship of a number of executives 
who frankly, uh, if you read the details, uh, didn't really do a very good job uh, in stopping Lucy Letby stopping uh, killing babies. Yeah. Uh, several doctors raised their concerns. They, uh, they were so sh closed down and shut down and told to shut up that they were even ordered to apologise to Lucy Letby. Uh, now, these uh, executives are uh, Ian Harvey, he was the medical director at the Countess of Chester Hospital, Alison Kelly, uh, she was, uh, I think, the director of nursing there, uh, Tony Chambers, chief executive of the Council Countess of Chester NHS Foundation, and Karen Moore, one of Letby's line managers, all of whom uh, I do have questions to answer. Uh, if you read the details, uh, a lot of people will be saying, well, why haven't the police spoken to them? And they haven't. Uh, let's talk to uh, former Scotland Yard detective Peter Blexley. Uh, Peter, yeah, you know, it's all very well announcing, yeah, we're having a look at this hospital. We might do the hospital for corporate manslaughter. That doesn't involve any individuals. Uh, the reason that this hospital could be possibly... Uh, convicted of corporate manslaughter is surely the uh, stewardship of these executives who ran the joint. Why aren't they in the frame? Why aren't the police investigating them? Well, with a corporate manslaughter or indeed a corporate homicide investigation, it is the organisation which is under the microscope. Of course, individuals within a company or a public body or a hospital or anything like that that is being investigated will be spoken to. And of course, we also need to remember that there's going to be a public inquiry into Letby's murderous behaviour. And that inquiry will be able to compel people to come to that inquiry and give their evidence. I'm sure that any corporate manslaughter investigation will pay huge attention to any evidence given by any of the people that you mentioned. Now, these investigations and convictions are quite rare when there is a corporate manslaughter uh, court case. Nobody is in the dock. The organisation or the company is represented by a barrister. And there have been very few convictions in the past. A similar kind of case, but not identical, was when, of course, the Met Police were charged with breaching health and safety legislation with regards to the shooting dead of Jean-Charles de Menezes back in 2005. And the Met were found guilty of breaches of health and safety and they were uh, very heavy fines were levied upon them. And that tends to happen in corporate manslaughter cases. These companies or these bodies or these organisations are fined according to their ability to pay any fine. Uh, indeed. Now, uh, but if you... You, I'm sure you've read the details of this case. I mean, you know, I can't go around making firm uh, accusations right now, but if you if you read the details, you know, there, there seems to me to be a serious case of negligence against some of these executives. You know, concerned doctors uh, time and time again said, you know, babies are dying around this woman, this uh, Lucy Letby, and they were sh shunted away. Be quiet. Doctors saying they were clearly more interested in the image of the trust up there, the image of the Countess of Chester Hospital, uh, than the fact uh, that babies might be being killed. Uh, and uh, at one point, extraordinarily, uh, one of the doctors who raised concerns was ordered to apologise to uh, Lucy Letby. Uh, she was suspended ended at one point and one of these executives uh, fought to, to get her back to work and she was back there soon looking after babies again. I mean, in the cold light of day, their activities uh, didn't look too great and if I was a copper, I'd be saying we need to look at these people for potential criminal ne negligence. Why aren't they? Well, they will be spoken to as part of this corporate manslaughter investigation and uh, we will, of course, hear their testimony at the public inquiry. It may be that other investigations may be launched. We simply don't know at the moment. But this is quite a, a groundbreaking investigation in many regards. Clearly, the police feel that the hospital, per se, as an organisation, has something to answer to. And we will see what evidence is gathered. There is, however, I find, a kind of corporate corrosive malaise in many public bodies, whereby 
They want to protect the image rather than tell the truth. This happens in policing. I quite often get notified by various sources who prowl the corridors of power and they say senior bodies are more concerned about perception than they are actually about the policing. And they say things like, how will this look in the newspapers? That's their concern. And I hear it from other things, local councils, NHS trusts and the like. And until we actually have individual responsibility for people who have failed in their duty, then I think we will continue to hear the most hollow, meaningless words that I know that you and I are quite sick and tired of hearing, which is... Yeah. Lessons have been learned. <laughs> uh, but, but, but there's the thing, Peter, you know, corporate manslaughter, I mean, in effect... Uh, you know, that, that's an investigation into a building, you know. Uh, now, the building, the Ch Countess of Chester Hospital itself, is not guilty of anything. Uh, if there is corporate manslaughter uh, involved here, it, it is people who are responsible uh, for that manslaughter. It is the people who ran the joint. Uh, and I can't understand why they're saying, let's go for corporate manslaughter, uh, when there are clearly people who have serious questions to answer. We're talking about executives who were running this order. Uh, aren't the uh, police going about this uh, the wrong way round? Shouldn't they be going for the individuals first? Because as you say, my concern about this is corporate manslaughter uh, should the Countess of Chester be found guilty of that, that uh, lets individuals off the hook. And individuals in this hospital, I think, have questions to answer. Do you see what I'm saying? Individual accountability, individual responsibility is what we need throughout our public services. Because there are too many people in public services with the attitude that I'm here to get as much out of it as I possibly can without being dedicated, focused public servants. And until we have individual responsibility in whatever walk of public service that may be, we, the great British public, will continue to be failed. I want individual responsibility. If there is evidence in this case, the Lucy Letby case, of individual failings, then it will be very interesting to see if any action stems from any such findings, if indeed they're there. Interesting, Peter. Uh, great to talk to you as always. Thank you very much. Uh, that's Peter Blexley, former Scotland Yard detective. Next up, a little bit of art. Uh, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like. Uh, but seriously, uh, Picasso, uh, the greatest master, arguably, of the 20th century, uh, is in danger of being cancelled because he wasn't very nice to women. Uh, we also have uh, a... Uh, a um, an exhibition coming up uh, by an artist called uh, Philip Gunston. Uh, that was cancelled, but it's back on now, Philip Gunston, uh, because he painted pictures of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, I don't think he was trying to eulogise them uh, or glamorise them, uh, but uh, they say that's a, a nasty subject, so he's facing cancellation as well. Uh, and also, just by way of an addition, uh, looks as if Banksy, the famous graffiti artist, is already being named. Uh, we may find out officially who that guy is very soon, but uh, we're going to tell you who, what name is in the frame. So all of that next. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. This is Talk TV.
Well, uh, cancel culture is very much in the news uh, every day in every way, really. Uh, now, a couple of artists uh, seem to be at the centre of a cult cancel culture drama. Uh, one is Picasso. Uh, I think we can say he was the greatest artist of the 20th century. Uh, certainly one of the greatest artists, one of the greatest masters of all time. He wasn't very nice to women. Uh, 50 years after his death at the age of 21, the BBC is delving into his darker side, Pablo Picasso. Uh, two of his exes uh, and one of his grandsons took their own lives. Uh, when he was 45, he had uh, a questionable relationship with a 17-year-old girl and basically was known to sort of use women. Uh, he used them, got them pregnant, painted them uh, yeah perhaps not a very nice guy when it came to women but is that any reason to cancel to remove from our consciousness the uh, brilliant works of art he gave to the human race uh, these uh, genius works Guernica uh, in my view maybe uh, the greatest work of art of all time uh, you know, is that any reason to get rid of him? Meanwhile, there's a, 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 a uh, exhibition at the Tate Gallery uh, by Philip Guston, uh, the artist, the controversial artist who depicts, uh, in an almost cartoon way, uh, uh, you know, members of the of the uh, Ku Klux Klan, you know, the racist group that lynch black people, uh, and because of this, because of this subject. Uh, he, he, he's faced cancellation now his um, exhibition is going ahead uh, but uh, you know it does beg the question you know Caravaggio the great uh, renaissance master you know he was a murderer and we still look at his paintings uh, you know is this the right route, route I mean these people do they deserve to be cancelled just because we don't necessarily like uh, their lifestyles? Let's talk to art critic Estelle Lovett. Uh, hi, Estelle. A, a few stories to unpack here. Uh, Picasso first. 50, yeah. years, 50 years after his death, the BBC doing this two-part documentary. It's called Beauty and the Beast, The Dark Side of Pablo Picasso. Uh, I mean, is there any point in cancelling him? Mean, you know, we need to separate, don't we, uh, the, the, these artists' genius uh, and, and their beautiful works of art and, and their characters and their lifestyles. Uh, we can't take these great works of art away just because we don't like the way Picasso treated women, can we? That's right. And, and we can't have Picasso who changed and moulded the course of modern art. We can't have modern art without Picasso. And we can't have Picasso without Picasso, as odd as it may sound. So really what we need to do is, is rather than cancelling and censoring artworks, we need to look at them and learn from them from the perspective of where we are today, where we are now. Um, would we today say that Picasso was a Jekyll and Hyde character? who had mental health issues would we say it's the circumstances of his upbringing don't forget his mother doted on him did everything for him he lived in a very macho sexist environment where his father introduced him as a young boy not only to art but also to brothels um so how can we separate an artist's artwork from his life because at some point the artwork does have to stand on its own doesn't it kevin yes. so post the hashtag me too uh, brigade we do have to be careful not to blend both of them we know that he was one of our greatest artists as you say um we also know yes he was a misogynist um he treated women poorly um he he had a big ego he was a narcissist um a, a level of disrespect for women but he also glorified and celebrated them on his canvas um he was a serial womanizer he loved young women. Uh, some say that his his best artwork was done when, as a 45-year-old, he had a relationship yeah. with the very young 17-year-old girl, which nowadays would have been frowned upon for sure. But should we not 
separate him from his art and realize that yes he was a genius artist but he did have huge human failings as we do you know it's interesting actually kevin when his um granddaughter marina said of the way that he treated women he said she said that he submitted them to his animal sexuality he tamed them bewitched them ingested them and then crushed them onto his canvas and i think that Explains it. That's a, and then that's a nice way of putting it. Uh, we haven't got too much time, uh, Estelle. Uh, so we both. Oh, well, let me, let me, we both. Let me just go on, very quickly, because we've got to get on to Philip Guston. What would you like? Okay, to say? I, ju I just want to tell you this then: that when he was in his seventies, he he didn't back down from his affection for women, and he used to make these little gold statues with oversized penises. And when he gave you one of them, that would be like his calling card that he wanted to take <laughs> our take with you. <laughs> OK, OK, I must get some of those myself. I'm not sure how effective they'll be. Uh, let's talk about Philip Guston. Uh, he's uh, an artist who produces, an American artist who produces uh, what I would call satirical pictures of the Ku Klux Klan, the, the uh, racist organisation in America notorious for lynching uh, people of colour and killing them. Uh, they've just got outright white supremacist racists. Uh, now, he was going to have a... Well, he is getting an exhibition now at the Tate Gallery, uh, but uh, bit previously it was cancelled. There's talk of him being cancelled uh, because of the subject matter of his art. I think these pictures are satirical. Uh, why would you... Just because he dares to confront uh, the reality of that awful organisation, the Ku Klux Klan. Why should we cancel him? And that is the reality of it. I mean, they are now to be seen at Tate Modern in London. And in organisation um, with four, three other galleries, National Gallery of Art in Washington, the Museum of Fine Art in Boston, and the Museum of Fine Art in Houston, um, th there's going to be the, this uh, amazing Philip Guston show. But you're right, there was a lot of controversy. It was cancelled back in 2020, postponed until now. And uh, th there were concerns raised. Is it cancelled because some of the images may evoke racist violence, which which was not Guston's uh, point, as you rightly said. It was, of course, delayed because of COVID and the logistical challenges with the cost of shipping during the pandemic and everything else. You know, everything else was in lockdown. So it was postponed. But don't forget, what's interesting about his KKK themes and images is that they are very timely now. And for our own individual reckoning, we have to look at these these images and um, this is what makes this exhibition actually perfect because he's making us confront how we are in the world today and not whitewash over it he's challenging us and he's he was as actually a supporter of racial equality he was a left-wing communist type if you like um he was a jew don't forget you know, he, he had his own um, attacks of anti-Semitism. His real name is Philip Goldstein. He had to change it to Guston. But he saw with his own eyes, he saw racism. He saw xenophobia. He saw American-led war efforts, which continue to, mm. to this day. And for him, the KKK, their hooded um, heads, to him, that was his way of standing up against racism. And he said, I painted them to try and understand the nature of their evil. And he tried to imagine what it would be like if he was to live with the clan so it may be a shock to the world and and we think that he was supporting mm -hmm. white social um injustices he was not he was looking at the banal triteness of how evil racism yeah. is against black people and jews and we're still fighting it today and to not look at it would do him and ourselves an injustice couldn't agree more uh finally i'm just going to reveal uh, we don't have time to talk about it, but uh, Banksy, uh, the famous graffiti artist, uh, he may soon be, uh, his identity is going to be revealed, allegedly, in a court case, a defamation case. Someone is suing Banksy's company, Pest Control Limited, and in the papers, in the documents for this legal case, Banksy is allegedly 53-year-old uh, uh, Robin Gunningham, who, of course, is public school educated. So Banksy 
maybe went to Eton for all we know, but he went to public school. Why am I not surprised? Uh, no time to talk about that, but great to talk to you, Estelle. Thank you so much. Estelle love it there. The people's art critic. When we come back, your calls. 0344 499 1000. Uh, this is Talk TV, and I am Kevin O'Sullivan. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? He's mocked your weight, Trump. Yeah, look at him. Fail. <laughs> Not working. Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. Do you believe you can win this war? Well, you're making me cry again. They're trying to force you out. Yes, I feel betrayed. Keep it award winning. Mwah. Lucy Letby will die behind bars. And a senior doctor who first raised concerns about Letby wants NHS managers to be regulated. We needed answers a lot sooner. This is, what, seven years down the line? I mean, it's, it's completely ludicrous. It was clearly something of the face of the ward, so it was even more mm. unthinkable. If this nurse had misgendered somebody on a ward, she'd have been out the door. When they first got together, there were press stories. Weighty Katie. That would make her a better Princess of Wales, because you're not just marrying the man, you're marrying the job. That resonates with people. Elaine Maxwell agreed to be interviewed for the very first time. I honestly wish I'd never met him. The Conservative Party can certainly win the next election. Can we? Yes. Labour has 29 no, no, points no, no, ahead no, no, in the polls. No, no, no. Can Come we? On. Did he say, yes, I have taken drugs, and they bent the rules, or lied on the visa application form and therefore got it? There needs to be an intervention around abortion laws. Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Parliament can determine these things. The rest of the world has watched on in sort of mounting horror as this story has unraveled. For you, it was incredibly personal. The death toll from the Titanic tragedy has risen to 1,522, and may God rest their souls. Let it roll! If we stop producing oil, the knock-on effect is far larger than just CO2. I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the charts in this <laughs> Don't Get make a mark, about Get make a mark. Some of them, they're easily led. You can kiss my American ass. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> very nice of you. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. We're now in Barbie world. You weren't asked to give evidence to the grand jury. I'm the only one that has been telling the truth. You don't drink, never taken drugs. Mm -mm. You're stinking rich. Should you be concerned, by the way? <laughs> if it's on your mind, it's on Talk TV. It's about you and your opinions. If you're thinking about it, we're talking about it. It's all about me. That's a joke. Welcome back. Uh, we're nearly there. Another 10 minutes. I'll, I'll hand over the reins uh, to Vanessa Feltz, who'll take you through. Uh, from 5 till 7 p.m. Uh, and uh, then it's Rosanna Lockwood, uh, then uh, Piers Morgan Uncensored. I think he's got Zlatan Ibrahimovic tonight, so uh, you won't want to miss that. And uh, you certainly won't want to miss the talk. That's on at 9 o'clock, and I'll tell you why you won't want to miss it. I'm on it. Uh, well, actually... <laughs> That might be exactly why you want to miss it, but I am on it, 9 o'clock tonight. And don't forget, I'll be back uh, tomorrow morning for another smash hit edition of Mike and Kev. Me and Mike Graham uh, on to right here on Talk TV from 9.30. Uh, we're doing it a little longer. It was half an hour. It's going to be 40 minutes from now on, so uh, uh, people seem to enjoy it. So uh, we've extended it a bit. And then I'll be back tomorrow at 3 p.m. That's enough. Announcements of when I'll be on Talk TV. Uh, it's time uh, to talk to you. I'll just read out a couple of uh, texts uh, that you've been kind enough to send in first. Uh, uh, here's one from H. Who are these people who decide to cancel others? Who appoints these people? And can we stop calling every man who is deemed to be mean to one or more females 
misogynistic or assigning the mental health label to anyone whose behaviour or personality uh, we can't put into a nice neat box. Interesting. Uh, here's uh, one from Vicky in Essex. This is interesting. She says, Kevin Keegan is OK to say what he thinks. That's Kevin Keegan saying he's not keen on women uh, punditing on male football. Kevin Keegan is OK to say what he thinks. As a woman that loves men's football, it grates me to have women com commentators. It's not the same. Stay away, please. That's from Vicky in Essex. Uh, interesting. Uh, and uh, we've got one from Paul here. Just stop oil. Let's stop oil. They are made up of the same kind of useless woke idiots you used to find on Greenham Common uh, and the Fast Lane Naval Base. I'm surprised Swampy hasn't popped up again. Remember that idiot? That's from Paul in Fife. Uh, just up oil. They're all middle class. They can afford to spend their time gluing their hands to roads and ruining other people's enjoyment of West End stage musicals. Uh, other people have to go to work. You know, have to feed their families. You know, they're not independently wealthy. They don't live in nice big houses in Tunbridge Wells. And take the day off to go and block a road. You know, ooh, we're saving the planet. Yeah. Uh, so we just found out Banksy may well be from a public school. Most of Just Stop Oil definitely are. Uh, now uh, let's uh, get to your calls. Uh, let's first of all go to Fred in Herefordshire. Hello, Fred. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Kevin. Thanks for taking the call. Yeah, it's just following on from the Thames Valley Police one. Yeah. Um, this this happened to me just five weeks ago with my local constabulary, West Mercia. And, it, you know, it was seen... It was last bank holiday we had, so not that long ago. And there was a marked police car, drove through a pedestrian precinct. And you think, well, no, that that's fine. Mm -hmm. Doing uh, patrol, you know, not a problem. And then... Um, and then drove about 40 yards up a one-way street the wrong way, which then went into another one-way street, drove about 20 yards into that, then turned right into a, a road that goes behind the back of the police station. Then two officers got out, walked up the street, and came back with a carrier bag full of takeaway food. And yeah. you're thinking, what's going on? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, they do seem to reserve the right to break the laws they're supposed to uphold. Uh, uh, and as many people are sending me texts and phoning in saying, well, you know, if the P Thames Valley Police want to send the proper message about that officer who chucked his sandwich into somebody's garden, uh, it should be that he gets prosecuted. That's against the law. Uh, you know, Thames Valley saying he, he will reflect on you know, his behaviour. You know, so what? Why not reflect on a criminal sentence? Uh, yeah, good, very good call, Fred. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Jill in Worcestershire. Hi, Jill, what would you like to say? Hi, thanks for taking my call too. Yeah, I was just going to say the same thing as you've just said. Um, surely it's a, a punishable offence to throw... It's, it's, it's against the law. You can be fined. I mean, it's not and the crime of the century, but it's against no, the law but, to litter. You know, it's these people, they don't just wake up and say, right, I want to go to um, be a policeman so they get the job straight away. They have intensive training, don't they, obviously. Mm. Yeah. And where's the training in consequences of not doing what, you know, practising what you preach, basically, and... You know, leading it by example. And the thing is, just to be a bit melodramatic... <laughs> go ahead, I like melodrama. Well, you know, it's, it's just a Thursday, yeah. Thursday afternoon, isn't yeah, it? Go, on, um, go for but it. But no, if he threw that sam salad sandwich and it had some sort of mayo and egg and somebody was... And it hit somebody and they were allergic to egg. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, just touching the skin, some people... Yeah, it's a good point. It's a good point. I mean, basically, Jill, you know, I'm sure you're the same as me. I don't consider myself to be a paragon of virtue who always no. be behaves impeccably. But I wouldn't dream of chucking a half-eaten sandwich out of my car as I was driving along. This copper, uh, in this instance, we don't know who he is and how he behaves generally, but in this instance, he seems to have no idea about right from wrong uh, and at first tried to deny he's done it. Well, where does this start from? It starts from um, when you when you. Sorry about. That's noise. all right. That's all right. I got one myself. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, when you're brought up, your parents instilled it. Don't yeah. you know? Take. I mean, I went to um, Burnham not so long ago this year, and and spent a lot of time picking up stuff off the beach. Plastic oh right, bags yeah. That yeah. could damage the plastic yeah. bottles yeah. and put it in the bin, just like 
too, yeah, well, too good young. For, good for you, because oh. littering is a scourge, and we shouldn't yeah. be having to watch cops do it. Jill, I've got to move on, but that was an excellent call. Thank you very much, Jill, in Worcestershire. And finally, let's go to David in Kent, who I think has an alternative view. You think that member of public, the seething citizen who shouted at the cop, that he should uh, be prosecuted, do you, David? Absolutely, Why? Kevin. I mean, if, Why? I mean, many, many of the people calling for the prosecution of this kid, basically, he's a kid, basically. Have he's a, a copper. Have he's not a kid, he's a copper. He's a copper, that's fine. But basically, Kevin, they haven't watched the entire video and seen the threatening, intimidating... I, I, I've, I've watched it all, and I think the citizen was well within his rights. Uh, he slightly lost his temper, but so would I under the same circumstances. That is not a kid, that is a serving police officer who just broke the law. Talking about a crust of bread, Kevin. A crust of bread. And well, uh, there you go, David. Interesting viewpoint on your point. David from Kent there. That's about it. I've been Kevin O'Sullivan. You've been an amazing audience. Vanessa Feltz next. I'm back tomorrow. Stay cool.